Great, and I'm going to live stream this on Facebook. Okay, here we go. Mastermind with Neil Schwartz and our special guest today is Mike Putnam, uh, all the way from the East Coast, baby. How are Thanks you? For being here. Yeah, we're doing great. Thanks for being here. My we pleasure. Really appreciate it. Really, really appreciate it. Actually, uh, you know, we had done this interview with you, oh my gosh, a year and a half ago now. Mm -hmm. So it's something similar to this kind of right after COVID started. And then your name came up. It was last week, Robert. Who were we? We were interviewing, um, I think, Whitney. No, not Whitney. Um, Malcolm. Milton. Milton James. Yes, Milton, Milton James. James. Milton James couldn't say enough good stuff about you. <laughs> so as soon as the call was over with him and I called and thanked him for the interview, which was tremendous, I picked up the phone and called you and said, hey. Help us. So Always we're really to excited help. to have you. So kind of refresh us, give us the Reader's Digest version, bring us up to speed of what you were working on, what's going on in your world right now. Well, I've been in real estate for, you know, 24 years. I was fortunate that uh, two weeks into real estate, I got my first Mike Ferry experience. Um, I'll never forget, I was at an action workshop. You know, when I first got into real estate, I always envisioned it being like stockbrokers, three-piece suits, everyone in the office at seven o'clock prospecting. And I'll never forget my very first day. I was so excited because, you know, I quit my job as a restaurant consultant. I was at the office at 6.30. I figured there'd be nine or 10 people in there excited. And I got there and I was by myself. Right. And I'm like, I'm in a three-piece suit. I don't know what I'm doing. I just know that I'm going to make a lot of money one day. And so... Eight o'clock came and no one was there and nine o'clock came. And I think the first agent came in around 10 o'clock. His name was Rick Groover and he was in jeans and a t-shirt and a hat and he was playing solitaire. And I remember looking like, what the hell is going on? I'm like, what are we doing? He's like, who are you? I'm like, I'm Mike Putnam. And how do we do this? And he's like, oh, just answer the phone. So, you know, I would say probably the first four, five, six hours, I just was a receptionist. And I was, I remember calling my mom. I'm like, I made a big mistake. There's a guy playing solitaire here. There's another person eating some donuts over there. Like I made a huge mistake. And she's like, oh, you'll figure it out. So my very first job was a telemarketer. And so what I did is I got the white pages. I remember going up and just being like, hi, this is Mike Putnam with Heartland Realty. I just want to know if you want to buy or sell a house. And then they would hang up, you know? And so, like, I just started doing that every single day, naturally, not getting anything. And there was a guy there who was retiring, I think maybe like a week and a half into the business. And he gave me these tapes and it was over the phone training with Mike Ferry. It was with uh, Tom Ferry and Matthew Ferry. And I just happened to see that a week later, Mike Ferry had this action workshop. So by then I had changed my dressing and, you know, now I was wearing khakis and I remember I had a polo shirt on and everyone else had facial hair. So I grew a goatee. And I'll never forget, we were at the workshop and he did this exercise where he had people on the front row and everyone's in these beautiful suits and ties and handkerchiefs. They just look like they made money. I'm like, yeah, I want that. And so he's asked this guy to stand up and he's like, how much do you need to break even? And the guy was like 10,000. And then he asked another guy, and it was 15, and another guy, 20, another guy, 30,000. And that's not to like make money. That was what they needed to break even in their lifestyle. I, to me at that stage of my life, because I didn't grow up with money, it was absurd to think that $30,000 is what you need to break even, you know? So like I was already a month, a month, a month. Right. And you have to think this is back in like 2000, you know? So, I mean, to me, that was so like out of just my mind. And so I was talking to the guy and when Mike was talking, he said, you stand up. And so like, I kind of looked around and he's like, you stand up. And I like hit and he, I remember he's like, don't make me come off the stage. And he's like, okay. So he like walked down the aisle and he looked at me and he said, stand up. And so I stood up and he's like, what's your name? I'm like, Mike Putnam. And he was like, Mike, you want to make a lot of money, don't you? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, you want to be a superstar, don't you? 
I'm like, yeah. He's like, you want everybody to know you, don't you? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you see that shit on your face? Get rid of it. Look at you. You look like a slob. He's like, if you come back in the auditorium tomorrow, dress like that with that on your face, I'll have them haul your ass out. Now sit down and shut up. So like I sat down, everyone's laughing at me. I'm like, damn. So like I go through the seminar, I'm watching all these people in the front. I'm like, there's something to it. So like I went home that night. I told my girlfriend that I was going to shave my goatee off. I'm going to wear a suit, these people. And she was so mad at me. And then the next day he was like, stand up. And I'm like, I didn't even do anything. And he's just like, you know how to listen. You have a half a chance. And I'll sit down and shut up. And then that day I, I joined one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, with Mike. And uh, I mean, I'm forever indebted. I, I wouldn't be where I'm at without having that foundation so early in my career with just being able to go on the phone with scripts, dialogues. And from that point in my career, it became an obsession with just learning how to communicate with people. Um, it is something that stuck with me. So, you know, here we are 20 plus years later. Uh, this year, I'll sell somewhere between 220 and 240 uh, in terms of units. Last year, I closed 175 and made 2.1 million. So this year, I should make somewhere around 2.5, 2.6 uh, million in terms of commissions just for me. That doesn't include uh, what my team makes. I have four buyer agents and I have four ISAs that make calls. And then I have two full-time assistants and I have a runner. And that's kind of where I'm at now. So, so the, t this is a team number or this is a you number. That's a me number. I have, my team will sell somewhere in the neighborhood of like another hundred, 110. Got it. Okay. So you're generating signs and they're living off of the sign calls and stuff like that. You know, to be honest with you, when I look, when we talked last time, you know, you get to a point in your career where you're thinking like, do you want to like phase out? Like I've done this for so long. Is there other things that you want to go into? You know, and then the market kind of shifted, you know, like this year I had this vision of selling 200, my team, you know, doing like 120 transactions with like buyer sides. But, you know, the buyer game changed. It reminded me a lot of 2006. And, you know, what you have to do now is you really have to work harder than you've ever had to work before. And, uh, you know, I had a choice in February. Do I reduce my number or do I make the decision to go back into when I say full production for me, full production is doing six, seven, eight hours a day of calls. Cause you know, I hadn't gone six, seven, eight hours of calls consistently in, you know, probably four or five years. And I can get away with my numbers just doing three or four hours. So, you know, I made the commitment. I told my wife, it was just like, you know, I feel like there's like another run left in me. And so, you know, I came up with a plan, you know, on average, I think since February 16th, I averaged like 6.7 hours a day of actual prospecting. You know, I have a dialer in my car. I dial on the way into work. I dial between appointments. Um, I use Mojo. And it's been amazing. I, I mean, my business has exploded and, uh, you know, it's exciting. I really feel like, uh, you know, it reminds me so much of when I first started, except I have a lot more skills. I have a lot more discipline. Um, because, you know, when I first started, I didn't know what I was doing. So I would call for eight hours a day. And, you know, the market right now, if you want to sell in high volume, it requires it because listings means you control the market. If you're a buyer agent and you're writing offers, it doesn't matter how good your offer is. You still have to beat the listing agent's buyer. If they have a team, you have to beat one of the team buyers. And if they know another agent, you have to beat that buyer. So there is no guarantee, no matter how good your offer is, that you'll even get it accepted. So if you're working buyers now, you really have to realize that you need to prospect your ass off to open your pipeline up so that you can work with people. Because there's a lot of buyers now that call. They have 10% down. They got 3% closing costs. They got 20 or 30,000 and they can't buy. I mean, I sold a house the other day listed at 925 for 1.18, $240,000 over the list price. I mean, if you don't have equity in terms of hard assets that you can liquidate, you're not going to be able to purchase in this market. So, you know, the amount of people that you work with, it's changed. And sellers are also harder because a lot of sellers are waiting for buyers uh, or for other houses to come on the market so they can buy. So you have less people wanting to sell their house because they're not confident that they can find one. So there's a, a dynamic in real estate that we really haven't seen, not to mention that the interest rates are going up. So for agents right now, it's a perfect storm. But the comforting thing, I think, for all of us is that if it's hard for us, it's fucking hard for them. If there's anything that I go to sleep every night knowing is that I'm really fucking good at what I do because I've worked my ass off every single day. And if it's hard for them, it's hard for us. Like we got that advantage because we, we work harder. We practice more. We have scripts. We have dialogues. We have masterminds. Like those agents can't compete with us. And that's the beautiful part is that we have an opportunity now to take so much market share because the market's only going to get harder, not easier. 
And if you know how to go out and control listings, you literally can dominate your market in a very short period of time, which is actually really exciting. It's something, as I said, just coming back in and putting the hours back in and, you know, outworking my team, you know, and them seeing me make the calls, it's even changed their dynamic. Because when they see me making calls for eight hours, it inspires them to want to do the same. All right, good stuff. I jumped off here for a minute, not even sure if we missed anything here. I apologize for that. Um, wow, that was amazing. Powerful. Very well, good. Neil, it's okay. I just want you to know that it was probably the best five minutes we've had in about, you know, six or nine months. So, you know, <laughs> don't worry, it's recorded. All right. <laughs> well, let me go back and watch it and then I'll catch right up with you. <laughs> The moral of the story oh. is, as agents, we have a huge, huge opportunity if we're willing to work our ass off. You know, if you're willing to make the calls, like you can get so much market share because, again, it's hard for everybody. And we're more skilled, we're more disciplined. We have people around us to hold us accountable. Like the market can't compete with people like us. And that's the thing, as hard as it is on some days, you have to remember it's just as hard for your competition. And they don't have skills, they don't have discipline, they don't have masterminds, and they don't have great people that are holding them accountable. They can't compete with us. And that should give anybody comfort in the moments because, you know, we're all on the phone. We're not getting the results we want some days or we got deals falling apart. But remember, it's hard for us. It's hard for them. And in that case, we always win. I can't stress that enough. It's a mindset that when you understand that we're on equal ground, but we have all of the advantages, you can't lose. But you have to be willing to play. And that's the problem with most agents today is they want a lot of money. They want a lot of deals, but they're not willing to do what it takes to get there, which is work your ass off. You have to talk to a ton, a ton of people. And even now I'm making 700 to a thousand calls a day because that's what the market requires if I want to hit my goal. So wait a minute, a thousand calls a day from you personally mm -hmm. or your Correct. group? For me. How, how you do that? Mojo. I mean, you have an auto dialer, you know, in the morning, the first thing I do is that, you know, 7.30 is when I start dialing the first expireds. You know, between 7.30 and 8, I hit the expireds three times from different phone numbers. And that's one of the keys is that you call from different phone numbers. You know, it gives you an advantage because you're not stalking them. And again, it's just like the other people because you have other agents that are calling. Most agents don't start calling till 8. And you have to think if you're calling at 8 and I've already called them three times by 8, who wins that battle most of the time? Because with expires, the early worm gets the worm. If I call at 8.30 or 9 when I have to do something with my kids, yeah, very hard for me to convert those because most people at that point, they don't answer the phone. If you get hit nine or 10 times in 15 minutes, how incentivized are you going to be to answer your phone? So you have to get up early and do what other people won't. And people are like, well, they're going to get mad at 7.30. Well, let me ask you, they're going to be mad at 8.30 too. And the people that are mad at 8.30 will be pissed off at 9.30. And if you're the 30th person, they'll be even more pissed off at 10. The earlier you get with the expires, the better off that you are. So what I heard you say, along with really hard focused work, is you're spending a little bit of money. It costs money to have three different lines mm -hmm. and it costs money to have a system like Mojo and it costs money to get the lines. And a number of agents just aren't willing. They're barely willing to get one one um, cell phone number, let alone Mojo and all the other tools. So do you have three different mojos working on those three different lines? No, I use one mojo. Mojo is a triple dialer. You can do a single dial, a double dialer, wow. or triple. When I'm calling the expires in the morning, I, I put it to two lines because at three lines, you know, there's only four or five, you know, numbers. So, you know, if I do three lines with that many calls, I'll just start getting a lot of disconnects where it'll call, it'll hang up, it'll call them back. So, yeah, typically I do two lines with that. You have to realize something. You're in real estate. You have two choices. I mean, back in the day, we didn't have auto dialers. You know, I used to double dial all the time. You know, Mike Ferry told me phone, phone to phones. the right, phone to the left, yeah. headset here, headset here. And I would just go back and forth for eight or nine hours a day. I mean, I did that for over a decade straight with two phones, two headsets. So, I mean, we have technology now that doesn't allow it. If you don't want to spend the money, then you can sit here with your cell phone and you can go bump, 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 bump. And you can just make your fingers bloody because, I mean, to sit there and make seven or 800 calls a day, the tips of your fingers would hurt. So we have choices. If you can't afford it, you have to say, is it that you can't afford it or you can't afford not to? But here's the problem is that most people, if they're saying they can't afford $180 for a phone, they probably can't afford to make the calls either. Because that's the thing. Once you actually invest the money, what do you have to do? You have to use it. So, so most people that don't want to pay for it, they just don't want the thought of having to make phone calls because phone calls for most people equals massive unbearable pain. 
when the truth is it can give you a life that literally nothing else in the are, world can give you. Can anybody hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. So we're talking expires. We're talking about really hard hitting, focused work to do. Now, do you just wing it or do you practice your scripts and dialogues? And did you come to it naturally or did it take a time to ramp up to it? Yeah, you practice every single day. I mean, you know, when my first 10 years, I had every script tied up, typed up on my wall. And at nighttime, I would spend two hours every night after work going through all of them. And I would go back and I would just go with my body. I internalize all that stuff. Like you have to realize, like the first stage of confidence is like when you just start to read your script. You have a script in front of you that you're reading. The second part is where you know your script's good enough that now you can listen because you have to realize something. If you're worried more about what you're saying than you are what they're saying, you're not actually achieving what you want. So the second stage is where you know the script good enough that now you can actually listen to what they're saying. And then the third part is that you've internalized it so much that now after you hear what they say, you can re repeat back your objection in a way that they can receive it. Because you have to realize there's analyticals where you can say it back with facts and figures. There's drivers where you can go straight to the point. If they're amiable, you can talk a lot more about emotions and feelings, you know, and then if they're expressive, a lot of times you can just ask them questions and they'll just talk themselves out. So it's not just saying the objection, it's saying it in a way that people can receive it. See, that's the thing with like men and women. It's we have messages, but the way a man would deliver something to a man is different than he would the way you would deliver it to a woman and vice versa. You have to realize that how you deliver information, it determines how they hear it. So if you're saying the same script in a way that is not in alignment with the way they think, they're not going to understand and it's not going to have the power. I mean, that's just the power of communication is saying things because they need to hear it, not because you want to say it. And Steve Powers used to always remind me that. Are you saying it because you want to say it and because it's on a script? Or are you saying that because after all of the training that you've done, that's what they need to hear? And that's a huge, huge part of communication. And you're doing it. Good for you. Good job. So are you telling me you're still role playing today? Every day. Every, Every day. day. You have to realize something. You, if you want to be the best at what you do, the practicing never stops. I mean, every single day I try to come up with better ways to talk about what's going on, you know, because like even the people, you know, I just want to leave it off the market, not a problem. Or is it, you want to leave it off the market because you need more time in the property or because you just don't think it's a good time to sell. See, for an expired after they say that first thing, it's such a beautiful way to just ask that very simple question. Because then a lot of times you're drawing out, you know, is it a condition that they have to stay here for some reason? Or is it because they think that this isn't a good time? And then the question is, what can you do to show them that? Because remember, we don't sell houses. We sell urgency. The number one thing as real estate agents that we sell is urgency, getting someone to do it now versus later. And a lot of agents, they don't understand that. Like you are selling one product and it's urgency. Can you get them to do it before I can get them to do it? Because whoever can create urgency with the client first, they get the paycheck. And that's the problem. If you're not proactive enough and you're not willing to ask questions and you're not willing to probe, then I am and I'm going to take your business. You have to find a way to create urgency for buyers and sellers about why they should do it now. If you can't explain that and you're not looking at what's going on in the market every day with rates going up and inventory being low, and you're not able to convey that in a way that people understand that if they don't do something, because really you have to realize something, people do more to avoid pain than they will pleasure. I had buyers last year when the rates were 2.4%, and I'm like, buy now, the rates are going to go up. And they're like, no, no, I'm going to wait till two. I mean, if it goes up to two, seven, two, eight, it's, it's not bad. I, I just think it'll go to two. And now you have people that are literally bowling over houses at 5%. People are more motivated at 5% than they were at two and a half. Because at two and a half, it was pleasure. Anything over five is pain. So we need to make sure that we're using that in our scripts and dialogues so that we can, we can use that to create urgency with people. Because people will do more to avoid pain than they ever want to do pleasure. And last year's interest rates and now shows you that. Last year, people weren't paying two and 300,000 over the asking price. But with rates going up now, people know that if you're buying a million dollar house, the difference between 5% and 6%, it's almost $300,000 over the life of the loan. So if I'm a buyer agent, I'm saying, look, pay $100,000 more over the house now. And by doing that, you will save 200,000 over the life of the loan. That's a pretty good deal.
See, that's creating urgency, but using the information in the market in a way that people can receive it. So 18 months ago, we got with you, you shared, I feel like this is today is a continuation of that 18 month. We just stop, put it on pause and move forward. So my question here is what makes Mike go? I mean, um, what are you reading? What are you eating? You know, what are you, what role plays are you, or, or who are you talking to that's, that's keeping this up at this level for so long with this intensity? I love what I do. Like every day I love being well, that's able to clear. help people. That's clear. <laughs> you know, I, I, I love going and competing against eight or nine people and everyone offering four and 5% and getting six. I, I, I love competing. I just... I love helping people. And like when you care more about your client than you do the commission, it, it, it shows because, you know, if there's there's one superpower that I have is I just care more than other people. I care. And I've learned over the years how to communicate in a way that people can receive it. I know how to talk to different kinds of people. You know, I mean, I had a client today. It's like, you know, her HOA, we had an HOA problem. And if it didn't close today, she wouldn't be able to close on her house tomorrow. And the HOA is saying 45 days. Well, most people would say, okay, that's 45 days, but I don't take that. You know, me and my assistant got together and we did all the things that we could and we got it approved today in six hours. Where most agents would wait 45 days, the deal would blow up, they would do that. I just care more. And it's the one thing the lady said, she's like, I never met someone that cares so much. Like when you love what you do, you don't work. You just get to play. And to be honest with you, COVID was a benefit last year, a year and a half ago, because it got me back into the mindset of having to grind a little bit. But, you know, when I looked at the numbers in February and I realized that I either had to retract my numbers, which have never gone down year over year, my numbers always have gone up or I had to do more. And then I made that commitment. It was one of the best decisions I made. I feel more alive now being out. I'm helping more clients than I've ever helped. I'm doing better. I mean, I'm communicating, I'm selling, I mean, I'm serving. It's a, uh, I'm excited every day. You know, I work out every single day. I think I've worked out for like 181 straight days in a row, you know, because I know that I have to work out my mind and my body. You know, I've been following Tony Robbins. So in the morning I do a, a meditation priming exercise that makes me feel appreciation. Cause you know, a lot of people show up to work. And the truth is, is that you need to make sure that you prepare yourself, prime yourself so that when you get to your office and you're on the phone, you're not starting cold. Like you're off and you're your best version of yourself because your energy, your excitement, people feel that and people want that. There's a, there's a part of that when people hear that, that it separates you because we all say the same script, but it doesn't sound the same with different people. So Mike, when you prime yourself in the morning, can you share with the group what that looks like? What that yeah, so like? It's a three or four minute uh, breathing exercise. I'll send you the link and you can send it. It basically calms your mind. You think about three things that you're grateful for. And you're not thinking about like, I'm grateful for my kids. You're thinking about a moment that you had with them where like, you're just grateful. Like, I mean, I mean, this morning, you know, I, I took my whole extended family on this trip to Mexico. And I remember I rented this like $30 million yacht and we're on this boat and my wife and then my kids and all my family's up there and they're playing and they're laughing. And I remember just like looking up and seeing this beautiful ship. And just realizing that because I work so hard, I get to give them this gift. And I remember just like crying in that moment and just reliving that moment. I just, I started to cry, you know what I mean? And, you know, and, and, I, and I was thinking today about this, this, this client that I helped and that literally, you know, had I not got back in and been working as hard, I never would have found him. And if they didn't find me, like this deal would have fell out. And, and just, I was thinking about just like how hard I work, like what an impact it has on people. You know, you start crying even more. And then I was just thinking about my, my baby and I just had a six month old um, and just like what a blessing it is to like bring up all these kids in this day and age where like you can grow beautiful, loving people. And it's just like, you know, when you put yourself in that place, you, I mean, if you do it right, you cry because we're so blessed. I mean, even even on our worst day, like people dream to be us. Like I have to realize in my life now, like what I consider a bad day, most successful people would wake up and dream to have that day, to have those problems, to have those deals, to have all these things. It's like, we forget that sometimes in the pursuit of trying to be successful, we forget about all of the beautiful things that we already have. I mean, because more possessions don't make you happy, but it is nice to have them. But when you look at, 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 at what you have, it, it gives you such an appreciation because it doesn't stop you from wanting more, but it allows you to just feel like accomplished. Because, you know, when I was coming up my first 15 or 20 years, I never knew how to appreciate what I had. It's like when I was at 90, I was pissed off because I was at 100. You know, I remember 
I had this vision of what it would be like when I was at a hundred, you know, when I was, I remember, I, I think I was at like 70 deals. I was like, next year I'm going to hit a hundred and on a hundred that night, I'm going to have my friends. We're going to go to a club. I'm going to get this limo. Like it's going to be the most magnificent night that we're going to celebrate the hundred. And I remember the first time I hit a hundred, it was like 1130 at night. I was by myself in the office. Seven deals had fallen out. My wife was calling me where I was at, you know, and I remember just thinking like, what the hell? And then I was like laughing because like, you've always wanted a hundred deals. This is what it feels like. Like everybody has this vision of what I want a hundred. I want a hundred. But then you get what you asked for and you're like, shit, like it's 1130 at night. You know, I've worked 18 hours. I'm at the office and all this shit is happening. And it's just, you know, you have to be careful because it's a process. Like you have to learn to grow into that person. And so the first stage for me is just getting into that gratitude and appreciation. The second part is just a priming where you just, you know, you bless your family. You're just thankful for all the beautiful people you have in your life. And then you wrap it up with just three things that you want to accomplish. You know, for me, you know, I think two and a half million dollars is, is, is what I want. And then I imagine all the beautiful things that I get to do with that and taking my family and all the different fun things that, uh, we have planned, you know, you know, I have an any aging company that uh, in the next three years, you know, I want to open up and I, and I think about that. And then I just think about financial freedom and what that looks like in the future, you know, having houses and taking trips and, and I just give myself a gift of what my future looks like. And by the time you do that for me, I'm just vibrating. Cause it's like, fuck, like, look at this beautiful thing that I'm creating. And it's just like, when you're in that place, there's nothing that can stop you. Cause you have to think about it when you're pissed off, everything is a problem. When you're stressed, everything's a problem. When you're in a beautiful power, empowering state, like problems just fucking bounce off of you because you know you'll either find the way or you'll make the way. And you don't really care which of the two it is. You just know that you're going to be able to do it. So it's like putting yourself in a beautiful, empowering state every day is probably the most important thing you can do if you want to sell real estate at high volume because we deal with problems every day. The biggest problem that real estate agents have is they think they shouldn't have any. And then they're pissed off when they do. It's like, you're selling 200 houses. How the fuck did you think you wouldn't have problems? I mean, if you got problems at five or six deals, how do you think it'll be at 200? It, it, the problems don't get easier. You just get better. And that's the thing a lot of people, it's like, don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. And then the last part is get better. And that's the beautiful part because it's like, we all go as you're coming up. You can only handle 10 and then everything is a problem. And then you get to 20 pendings and then it's like everything is a problem. And then you learn to get to 30 pendings and everything's a problem. It's just we have to learn that we have to grow ourselves. And if you're feeling stressed, it means that you just haven't grown into that person yet. And that's not a bad thing. The question is, is what do you have to do? There's a gap between where I want and where I want to be, because anybody could get to 100 deals if they're willing to sacrifice everything they humanly have, you know? But is that what you really want? You know, I see so many real estate agents, they chase money and then their wives don't know them. Their kids don't know them. They have shitty lives. They don't have any friends. It's like, that's not success to me. Success is not my wife not knowing me, my kids not knowing me, me not having friends. Like life is too short. And I see so many agents, they chase a number or they chase, you know, the, 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 the success of what they think it is. And then they get it. And it's just like, shit, this is fucking hard. Like I have no friends. I have no free time, you know? So you just have to be very careful with what you want and learning to build a life that is sustainable, you know, because everybody tries to obtain things. I want a hundred deals, but is it, do you want to obtain a hundred deals or do you want to sustain it? Meaning that you'll have that in your forever. See at this stage of my life, if I want something, I'm not trying to obtain anything. Obtaining is nothing. I can obtain anything. My goal is how can I sustain something? And when you start asking questions from a sustaining standpoint versus just obtaining it, it's like, I want a Rolex watch. All right, go out to the street, beat up someone that has a watch. You have the watch. But if you became the kind of person that could afford it, that's something that's completely different. Really good stuff. Great words, great energy. I want to know how you really feel about it, though. <laughs> <laughs> really good. Excellent. So tell me from, uh, from your perspective, you know, you've got agents on here in the in, in multiple different levels. But if you've got somebody in this kind of kooky market, they, they don't have your passion, your energy, uh, your skills yet. OK, but they have the desire to do it. What's the one, two, three things that they should be working on in the next 90 days to start getting on your path, Mike's path? I think the first thing you need to do is that if you're stumbling on certain objections, you need to write that down. Even to this day, if I 
have a problem or I don't handle something, I write it down. And at the end of the day, I don't leave until I've come up with something, a, a better way to like to say that. You have to understand that if you know what to say, you'll always know what to do. So the first thing is creating scripts and dialogues and then becoming absolutely obsessed with them. See, that's the thing is like, you need to be obsessed because remember, if you're worried about what you're saying, you're not hearing the little pieces you need to do to be able to convert and to, to close people. Communication is about listening. If you're just talking to them and they feel that it's not going to be as connected as when you can just 100% listen and know that no matter what they say, you have the answer. Second thing is that, you know, I remember Milton James three years ago. He's like, hey, bro, I heard about you. You know, I'm struggling. You know, what do you think you would do? And I'm like, do you want me to be, give you the honest answer? Or do you want me to tell you what you want to hear? He's like, well, what do you, 100 contacts a day. 100 contacts a day makes everything go away. 100 contacts a day makes everything go away. And I told him that. At your stage of life, at your production and where you are in your business, you have nothing better to do than to cold call around every city in your entire area and get 100 contacts a day. And it's interesting that I said, look, do it. If you do it, I'll help you. And I said, call me back every couple of weeks. I'll be a little mentor. I'll help you. But you have to do your part. I won't help you if you're not willing to help yourself. It was beautiful, man. He's like, oh, my God. You know, because at first it was hard. He's like, oh, 100 contacts is impossible. I was thinking, well, you know, back in 2017, I literally averaged 111 contacts for the entire year. 111 for the entire year. I'm like, it is possible. And he did it. And his whole business transformed because you have to realize if you're saying that script over and over and over again, a hundred times a day, and a normal person is saying it 20 times a day, that means that every day you're getting five days worth of work. That means that every week you're getting a month of work in that they do. Like think about how that compounds over two or three or four years. You know, like I'm a big Kobe Bryant fan. And I remember a couple of years ago, he was talking about, he gets up at four 30 and he trains and then he trains at 12 and then he would train around two and then he would train again at like seven. And he was like, if I'm working out four times a day and someone else is only doing it two times a day, and you take that out seven days, 30 days, six months a year after four or five years, there's no way that people can catch up with you. But the question is how committed are you? How committed are you? How big do you want your business to be? Cause that's the beautiful thing about real estate you can grow this beautiful million dollar business if you put the work in, or you can grow this business and have a different kind of lifestyle. It's up to you. You get to grow it however you want. But it always comes back to that if you're going to work, you're sacrificing to me the most sacred time. My most valuable thing in my life is my time away from my family. So if I'm going to be away for 16 or 17 hours a day, I need to make sure that I'm getting the value out of that. That's why, you know, during the day now, Monday through Friday, I have a driver. So when I'm going to my appointments, the driver drives me around. I'm in the back. I'm making calls. I'm prospecting. So like I don't lose anything. So I could prospect all morning. I have my appointments. I'm prospecting on the way to my appointments. I'm prospecting on the way back. I'm coming back, catching my breath, getting back on the phone, going back to the next appointment. Like I have nothing better to do at this stage of my life than prospect on it. And again, you got for sale owners, you got expired. You know, for me, I have ISAs. So, you know, they give me leads of people that they talk to and I'm following back up with them. And if I have no one else to call, even to this day, I'll just cold call around different areas that I sell a lot in. It never stops because in real estate, the day that you stop calling people and if no one calls you, you're out of business. So like if you stop calling and you're sitting at your office and you're just like, and you do that for two hours, you might as well just be out of business. It's like having a restaurant and turning the thing over and saying, out of business. You're not allowing any customers to come in. Really, really good stuff. Excellent. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go into some questions right now, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, excellent. All right, questions for Mike Putnam. Questions for Mike. Raise your hand, jump in there, go Mike. with it. <clears throat> hey, Mike, Miguel Soler here. Um, you're prospecting, you're using the mojo. Uh, I get stuck into like what, what buckets I put them in and when do I follow up with them? So what, what's your system for? You have to simplify it. I had an agent come out and, and shadow me. It's so funny. I had an agent come out and shadow me, but he wanted to shadow me from uh, nine o'clock to five o'clock. And I said, if you want to shadow me, you come live with me. You get up at 430 in the morning, you work out, you do meditate, you do this because I want someone to see what it's like. And so by the time we got to the office, like the first day, it was just like, holy shit, like I'm tired. It's nine o'clock. 
But I looked at his, his mojo. He had like 25 different folders. I'm like, dude, what the hell are you doing? Like, you have to realize something. You want to have a future folder where you put everybody that you need to talk to in the, in the future. You want to have a lead follow-up folder of anybody that you've probably called 20 or 30 times and doesn't answer. And then you would have a hot leads of people that you know are going to sell that you haven't made anybody get a hold of. Like if I have a calendar, if you do it right in Mojo, you set up a calendar call. If I call you and you don't answer, if I know that you're hot, I put you in a hot lead and I dial that four different times a day from five different, from four different numbers, rather. The lead follow-up one, I dial that at least twice a day. So like right now in my hot leads, I probably have about 37 people in there are people that I know are going to sell, but I haven't been able to get a hold of them. And then I have a lead folder, which after 50 times of not getting a hold of you, I just put you into the lead folder because maybe I get a hold of you, maybe I don't. And then I dial that. So I really only have three folders. I have a future folder where I park everybody. And then I have two different lead follow-up folders. One is the one I hit four times a day from different phone numbers. And the other one, I think there's like 120 and I hit that twice. Because simplicity is what you want. You have to realize complexity is the enemy of execution. The more folders you have, like the more complicated it gets. Like it doesn't matter if it's a past client, if it's a for sale boat or an expired. On every call, you either dead somebody or you make a commitment to call them back. So if you can simplify your system of follow-up, it makes it very easy. Because think about that. That's the only choice. You either can set up an appointment, you can dead that person, or you can put them up for a lead follow-up call. What do you do now? Uh, I will, I, I have like four different, five different folders and I do calendar calls on some of my hot leads that need a future call. Do you use the follow-up, the calendar? What'd you say? Do you use the calendar? Do you set? I do, but you have to realize if like today I got, when I got in this morning, there were 17 people that I had to call. Okay. So I couldn't get a hold of those 17. So I put them all into my hot leads. I call that hot leads four times a day from different phone numbers. Because if your calendar, if you if, if I if I have a calendar call with you, you don't pick up. My only choice is to either put you for a follow-up call in the future or to call you. If I say I'll call you, I'm gonna put you in a folder on an auto dollar that allows me to call you four times from different phone numbers throughout the day. Got it. Makes sense. Because the thing is like you have to be proactive. It's like in this day and age, it's it, like people are so busy. It's not that they don't want to sell their property, but you have to catch them in the right time at the right place. So like by calling them at different times, at, at different days, just like, you know, I made a commitment every Sunday between six to eight, I get on the phone and I call all of my leads. I call them all twice from different phone numbers. And Sunday six to eight is one of the most profitable two hours that I have because I'm getting a hold of people that I never get a hold of during the week. Because remember, like Mike Ferry says, you have to get a hold of someone the moment they're ready to make the decision. If you're calling them in the morning and they're at work, you're calling them in the afternoon, they're at lunch, you're calling them or you get her, like you have to keep calling them. And if you call them from the same number, they get used to it and they won't answer it. That's why if you have Mojo, you should have like 10 or 12 different phone numbers that you can swap and call people out from. That's why if I'm trying to get a hold of you, it's very hard for, for, for you not to, to pick up because I'm going to call you from so many different numbers. I just had this lady that I listed. I called her 37 times before we, we met. She didn't hire me. She's interviewing five other agents. Every two or three days, I would call her. Hi, Michelle. This is your real estate agent, Mike Putnam. Hi, Michelle. How are you? It's your favorite real estate agent, Mike Putnam. How are you? Michelle, I know you must be busy. And I kept doing that. One day, she's just like, you are one persistent son of a bitch. And I was like, that's why people like you hire me. <laughs> and it, it's funny because we're actually going to closing here at 430 for her house. You know what I mean? She literally, most people at 37 calls with no callback would dead it. I'm not deading that ever. I'm going to, you either say no, or I keep calling you until you die. It's very, 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 just, it's, it's the way I operate. Wow. You have to be that obsessed with getting a hold of them. And again, she was going through a lot, a very difficult time. So like I had to catch her at the moment that she was ready to pick up the phone. And that's what you want to do. If you're selling at high volume, you have to be obsessed with lead follow-up. 84% of all of my business is all through lead follow-up. Only like 14% is me getting unexpired on the phone or for sale boner or past client right away and just going straight out. You have to be obsessed with the process. And that's the thing with a lot of people. They're not obsessed with the process. They want this quick fix. I'm a good agent. I'll call you. I'll leave you a message and you will call me back. If you're operating like that, you're done. You ain't going to sell houses because you will quit and I won't. And then I take your money and I, and I take it happily. 
I love it. I love it. Other questions, uh, Tyrone? Did you have one? That's uh, wow. This is this is great. I'm trying to keep up. I can't even keep up writing. Um, you mentioned earlier. You mentioned uh, what? You use the five percent or the interest rates to create urgency. What are some of the other techniques that you use to create urgency? Well, I think for a lot of people now, most sellers are saying they want to wait. So I say, are you wanting to wait because you just need more time in the property? Or is it that you you just don't think it's a good time to sell? Well, we're not really sure. Well, you know, you can wait. But, you know, you, what you may not realize is that with interest rates going up, what we're seeing in the marketplace right now is that all of the buyers that have money, which is what you want, that we're going to buy in June and July and August, they're all flooding the market and buying now. Because let me ask you a question. If you have a choice right now to buy a rate, a house at 5%, or you can buy something this summer at 6%, what do you think you would choose? Right. So we know that right now, more people that have money are buying. And at the exact same time, the inventory is low. So we know two things. If you put your property on the market now, not only do you have more qualified buyers, but you have buyers that are incentivized. And what I mean by that is that if you look at your house, it's a million dollars. If they get 5% right now, do you know that over the life of the loan compared to a 6% rate, they would spend $300,000 more over the life of the loan? So if you're a buyer that has money, do you think if you were to pay fifty dollars or $100,000 over asking price, but you knew by doing that, you would save two hundred? Would that be a good deal? I mean, if I could show you how you would save two hundred, you'd probably think that I was a pretty good agent, right? So what we know is that with more buyers having money, because you have to realize something, the challenge you'll see in the fall or towards the end of the summer is all the buyers that can't buy right now, those will be the buyers that will be buying in the late summer. Buyers that are qualified, buyers that have down payments, but buyers that aren't liquid. So let me ask you something. Is it more important for you to take your time or more important for you to get the best possible price for your home? That's price. Correct. For most people, it'd be price. So that let's set up an appointment and let me show you how I can do that for you. Last week, I listed someone at 920. They got 1.18. This weekend, I listed another house for 850. They got 900. I mean, if I put 50 to $100,000 over the asking price in your pocket, you would not be mad at me, would you? Nope. I'll see you at five. Good stuff. All right. Very good. Okay. Other questions? <laughs> hey, Neil. Mike. Go ahead. Neil. Huh? Uh, the yes. question, when he, when he said that he's, uh, Michael, when you said that you're calling from different numbers, I probably missed that part. How, what is the process? How did you call from different numbers? So in Mojo, you can buy phone numbers. There's also other ways that you can buy cheaper numbers. I forget the name. I can look at it. You can buy numbers for like $2 mm -hmm. a number. And then you can upload it into Mojo. See, when you're calling people, you want to have 10 to 20 numbers if you're making a lot of calls that you can go through and call from. Because again, if you call from the exact same number four or five times, it makes you look like a stalker. So right. if I'm calling the expireds five or six times a day from different phone numbers, they never know that it's the same person. So they're more likely to get up because if they see the same number calling them, in most cases, they're not going to pick it up. Right. Okay. One, one, Thank you. One Thank you, Mike. One quick follow-up question with the numbers that you have. Does it all go back to your uh, a, a cell phone with like a, a recording, like a, a voicemail message from you or you just leave it blank or how do you do that? What do you mean? Like when I drop a message? No, I mean like, for example, you use different numbers, right? But if there's a callback, does it go back to just your cell phone or does it go to something? No, I mean, what you, what you, the thing is you don't want to, you don't want to have everything going back to your cell phone because you're right, of course, you yes. a thousand calls, mm -hmm. you know, yep. you're going to get 600 people calling you. So I link it to a number. I, I want to call, I'm trying to think, I think it's called dial tech is the yeah. company I use, and we do a back number and then it leaves voicemail messages in my email. So if they leave a message, it'll send me an email with the voice transcript that I can then see. Most of the people that call back are like, go fuck yourself, you know, I'm gonna right. shoot, <laughs> jump off the building. But you know, I, I do voice drops on every call. So I mean, I probably get 10 to 15 deals a year from just dropping messages with some of the calls. Obviously if it's an expired, I have a certain message. If it's for sale by owner, I have a separate message. If it's a cold call, right. I have a separate message. But if you're doing Mojo, it's easy to hit a button and say drop message. And as I yes. said, I get 10 to 15 deals a year because of the volume of calls I make. Yes. Thank you. One, one last quick question on your cold call to, uh, to neighborhood, for example, I know that you go in, you're trying to get like, you know, uh, as much contact as possible. Do you go in with, with like a circle calling, like a just list that 
just so call or just a call in like, hi, Mike, I was just wondering if you're interested in selling your house. No, I just, say how this is Mike I just say how this is Mike Putnam with Remax. I had a quick question about your property over on Pear Tree. was just curious if you had thought about selling your home here in the near future. I'm not sure if you know, but right now the inventory is extremely low. And as a result, we're seeing increased pricing. I'm just curious how much time do you think you would take before you would consider selling? Yep, and I think just start off there. there. And a lot of people, well, you know, I'm not sure, yada, yada, gotcha. So, I mean, do you think, you know, you need more time in the property or is it that you just don't think it's the right time to sell? It's the same type of stuff. And then you kind yep. of take it. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. No, my, my pleasure. All right. Good what? stuff. Go ahead. Who is that? This is Tess. Tess, go ahead. Hi, Mike. Uh, Thank you. Question for you. So, I mean, I'm sure that you are here right now and you have a very good objection how did you learn? Did you have accountability people that you are in a group, you know, as far as those objections? Because those verbiage that you that you're saying is basically very technical in a way, if you would not really, you know, uh, don't know it, but you're so like, this is like, you're, it's almost like dancing in the script is what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, you have to realize something. I mean, if I was to give you all a script, you, you don't want to take what I'm saying word for word. You would want to take yeah. the essence of what I'm saying and you would say it your way because like you don't want to have robots. You don't want people that sound like me. You want to take yeah. the message of what I'm saying and you want to say it in a way that you can receive it. But yeah, you know, like I think it was 15 years ago, I started this group uh, with Mike Ferry called the Alpha Dogs. It was like me and Jim Sandval and then Jared Zimmer came on and then Lee Marcus came on and then Jason Penrose and then Renee Soro and then we had Carlos Guerreras. So, you know, there's 10 of us. And every morning we text our numbers to each other. You know, we're going on a trip to Mexico. I think we rented out a $20 million house that we're going to stay in for four or five days and do fun stuff and, and mastermind. And, you know, we hold each other accountable. But for me, with objection handling, I'm obsessed with it. Like, I'm obsessed with asking a better question. Because you have to realize the only thing that separates you from what you want is a question. How do you ask a better question? And the thing is that when you get stuck, it's your responsibility to go back and say, damn it. Like, what could I have said better? I, that, like, that person was, a, was a, a, an expressive. How could I have asked a better question to, like, open them up? Because you have to realize something. Like, if, if you don't get people in the right mindset, to sell, they uh -huh. won't sell. Like I'm in an appointment the other day and the guy, I didn't know this, but I guess his wife left him and his kids left him. And all I could feel was pain. And uh -huh. he's not going to list his house with me. He's pissed off. He's angry. And I looked at him. I'm just like, brother, like, I feel your pain. And he's like, you don't know about it. I'm like, I don't know it, but I just know that like, I feel that. And I just want to show like, I have compassion for whatever you're going through. He's like, your wife didn't leave you. And then it starts going off on this tangent. But you see, now I have something that I can deal with. See, him right. holding that emotion in there, it doesn't matter what the fuck I say. He's not going to be able to communicate with me. But once I knew that, I was able to kind of rewire and say, I know that your wife left you and you can't do anything about that. But you just said that your daughter is getting back in your life. I was like, I don't know you. But what I do know is that you're a love bug. You have a huge, huge heart. Correct me if I'm wrong. See, now I'm starting to get a little rapport with him. And I was like, you would never go and leave your daughter when you just got her back. You're a love bug. You're the kind of guy that would do anything to rekindle that relationship, which is why you're selling your house and going there. So you can sit here and tell me you don't want to sell your house all you want. But the truth is, it's not about the house. It's about you getting closer to your daughter. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to overstep my boundaries, but this is not about a house. This is about you and your daughter and the relationship that you want. And he just started to cry. And at that moment, I knew that I, I, I had it because now I got to the root cause. See, that's what I mean. It's like all the scripts and dialogue is good, but you also have to care enough to like see your client and be able to address things. If In that appointment, he would have been pissed off. I'd have told him the comps and he would have said, I got to think about it. 99% of agents would have walked out. But you see, I cared. When I saw him in pain, I was willing to ask a question that maybe was uncomfortable knowing that he was probably going to come back with me, but I, I've been trained enough that like, I'm willing to dance that way. See, that's what I mean. It's like, like people always say they're not good salespeople, but like, who's the person that you love the most in your life? Name one person you love. My kids. Okay. If one of your kids was on a bridge and they say they were going to jump, you would be the best salesperson. Why? Because you care. You, care. you would never, ever get off that phone until you knew your kid was down. And it's the same thing with clients where you're in an appointment and <sighs> suffering if you're not willing to go that extra bit you're not going to get the business because like the ultimate way to sell is to serve 
-hmm. When you come from that place where you're just, it's, the, it's not about the house. It's just, I just want to help you. Like you're seeing this human being in pain. Like it's a connection that you can't get anywhere else. And they feel that. Because again, it wasn't about the house. Once, once I said that, like he realized and he was ready to go. But like, had I not said that, and, and, I, was the, and I was the 11th agent in there. Wow. Because most agents would leave. There's nothing there. The guy's pissed off and he's angry, but he's not angry. He's hurt. So you can know your scripts and dialogues, but unless you want to understand your clients and you're willing to play there, you're not going to be able to take listings at high volume. And I hope that answers your question. Yes, you did. Thank you so much. That was very good. Love it. Hey, Neil. Neil. Go ahead. Neil, why did you ask him how much it costs to put a microphone in his office? <laughs> so, so good. interesting idea, Michael. Um, so, Mike, this is, uh, this is fantastic. And it probably we have another call that we need to do together because it's just amazing what we can. Uh, I mean, I love to help people, you know, to me, you know, when I came up, there were so many people that helped me along my journey. It's always good to be able to help other people. You know, the goal for all of us is to get so good that we can give back to help others. That's, 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 that's what life is about. It's about obtaining enough knowledge and getting so good that you can help other people. And that's, 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 that's what my life's about. It, and, and you do it really well. Tess, kind of an answer where Mike was talking, you asked him, how do you get that good? How do you get that polished? How do you, how are you able to, to rattle off 5%, this and this and this? Yeah. And I did a teeny bit of math when you guys were talking there. And basically, if he does 700 calls a day, not 1,000, but 700, all right? And uh, Mike, without disrespecting you, I'm yeah. just putting yeah. a number out there. So at the end of the week, that's 3,500 calls that your people you've talked to. Those are contacts, right? Seven, seven times five. Yes, 35. 3,500? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's not 3,500 contacts. 700 contacts a day. Yeah. Nobody's no. making 700 contacts a day. Mike. No, Mike. 700 calls. 700, 700 calls a day. On, on average, on average, I make about 65 contacts a day. Okay. 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 That, that, that would be a really good record. <laughs> yeah, I know. 300. You have to realize something. If you're making 60, 70, 100 contacts a day, and you're doing it intensely, not just bullshitting, but you're actually pushing and asking questions and working to get better. And at the end of the day, you have five or six things that you really work on and say, you know what, I have to get better at that. And then you work on that. Then the next day you ask a better question and then you have a new list. Like it's, it's an evolving thing. Every day, your job is to ask a better question. How can you say something better? You know, how do you, how do you take something and, 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 and frame it in a way that they can receive it? Cause we all get hung up on something that someone says, remember you either sell them or they sell you. The problem is, is that they sell us most of the time because we're not committed to evolving our scripts. It's like, we all have like the Mike Ferry script, but the question is, how do you evolve from that? You have to evolve your dialogue. Cause remember you're talking to human beings. You're not talking to robots. Yeah. You have to make sure that you're saying things in a way that they understand, but also how often are you all actually working at coming up with better objection handlers? How often do you take something that you hear in the news and say, you know what? Like, Damn it, how can I use that? Like, what angle do I use and start to create stuff and start to test it and play with it? If the people that are around me every day prospecting, every day they'll hear me say something new because every day I'm working for 35 or 45 minutes of coming up with just better ways to say stuff. I'm taking anything that I hear in the news that I hear that I feel like I can use to help people create more urgency. You have to evolve your dialogue. And more importantly, you have to become obsessed. I can't stress that enough. You have to become obsessed with the dialogue where you can talk to anyone, any place, any time. I remember being at a Mike Ferry event and uh, it was an action workshop. And, and I think it was, Tom came over and was like, I need you to do me a favor. I'm like, yeah, what do you need? He's like, I need you to go up and do a listing presentation in 15 minutes. The guy that was going to do it can't do it. I need you to go up in 15 minutes. So in 15 minutes, I'm going to say this thing. I need you to go get Mike up. Now, how many people in that moment would have a heart attack? The fact that you're going to go up in front of 2000 people and do a listing presentation, but when you do it over and over and over and over every single day, it's just, it's not what you say, it's who you are. But if you don't want to become a script or you don't want to just say scripts and dialogues, you want to become, that's the person you are. You're just a master communicator. And that's the beauty of real estate. When you are so good that you don't have to even think about it. 
you study and practice and then you go out. It's like when people play basketball, they're not thinking about shooting. All they're doing is catching the ball and having fun. See, if you practice off, then you get rewarded in public. That's what people don't realize. The more you practice in private, the more you get rewarded in public. <laughs> people would never know how often and how long I spent practicing, refining, and working on my communication. I was obsessed with it. I took every NLP course, and I'm still obsessed with it. I always want to know how can I communicate with people better because the better you can communicate with people, the more people you can serve. And at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Hey, Michael, uh, what, what is your routine when you feel, I don't know, maybe, I, I don't know if you have some days that you are down or you're coming from escrows, the word challenge, and it fell out. What is your routine to get over that? If there's anything that people would know about me is I've mastered the art of doing things I don't like. You have to realize something. It doesn't matter how you feel. See, it doesn't matter if I, I mean, I, honestly, I would say I get up at 4.30 every day to work out. So if, if, when I'm up at 4.30, I would say out of 100 days, there's probably two days that I wake up and I feel good. Every day I feel like shit. My eyes are burning. I don't feel good, but I don't care. I don't do things based on how I feel. I don't do things based on stress. For me, I put my headset on, I listen to music, and I hit start. And that's the beautiful thing about Mojo. Once you hit start, there's no going back unless you stop. You have to become the kind of person that does things regardless of how you feel. How you feel does not matter if you want to be successful. See, that's what separates the people that are the best from people that are good is most people get up. Like, for instance, I remember Mike Ferry. He was, he was, he was coaching with me, and he told me I was going out a lot. And he said, I don't care if you go out. He's like, if you're going to go out with the boys, I have one rule. You get up with the men. And I always stuck by that because it doesn't matter what time you went to bed. If you're supposed to get up at 4.30 and prime and work out and meditate and get to the office and start your calls at 7.30, like when you went to sleep and when you got up, it doesn't matter. If you didn't get sleep because you went out, whose fault is that? It's yours. See, that's the thing. When you learn to do things that you hate and you find a way to love it anyways, your whole life changes. It's like, you know, when my wife wants me to go something, I don't want to go. I hate it. I have two choices, make her miserable or just find a way to love what she does. I don't care how I feel. Whatever I do, I'm going to find a way to enjoy it. And I hope that answers your question. It's not what most people want to hear, but like you have to become obsessed with doing stuff that you hate. Oh, that was awesome. I bet you when you went out um, having parties or whatever, you were the king of the night. Oh, I did. I would party hard. But you know what? I was at the office every single day at seven o'clock, no matter when I went to sleep. I, I learned that early, but... I refine that because, again, doing stuff based on how you feel will never get you what you want. Never. And that's the problem with most people. We do things when we feel like it. I, honestly, nine out of 10 days, I don't feel like making a ton of calls. I don't. So it's the last thing I wanted. I, had a call, I think it was, what was it? Tuesday. I just, I just didn't want to make a call, but it doesn't matter. At 7.30, I hit the button. I put music in my ear. And that's it. It's not a choice because it's not what I do. It's who I am. And that's where your life changes. When you make it who you are, you're the kind of person that does it regardless of how you feel. When you're supposed to do something, you just do it. Just like, you know, I made a pact that I was going to work out every single day. I've worked out for 181 days in a row. See, when I get up in the morning, am I thinking about working out? No, it's not an option. I just do it. Mike, can Mike. you take us very quickly through your daily schedule? Just yeah. I get up, at four, get up at 4.30 in the morning. I work out somewhere between 4.45 and like 5.45, somewhere in that range. Before I work out, I meditate. So I guess I get up at 4.30, I get, up at 4 get into my, uh, my gym at 5. I meditate, do an Anthony Robbins priming for 15 minutes. I work out for 45. That takes me to 6. I eat breakfast. I shower at 7.30. I'm on the phone calling the expireds. I call them four times between 7.30 and 8. At 8 o'clock, I leave my house. I call in the car on the way to my office. And then I do that all the way till 12 o'clock. Then I'll typically have lunch. I'll meet with my assistant, go through any challenges, anything like that. If I don't have appointments, I get back on the phone and then I call till seven. If I have appointments, I'll go out in between that. But my whole day is based on calling between 7.30 and seven at night. And from eight o'clock, who do you call if you're in the car until you get to the office? Just I'll call the expires again. I'll call the for sale boners and then I'll upload my hot leads and I'll start calling all of my hot, hot leads in the car. I'll, I'll double dial my hot leads because there's only like 35 or 40 on my other leads that I call that I may have called 50 or 60 times. I'll triple dial those people because, you know, a lot of them don't pick up. But every day I'll get like four or five or six of those people. 
And then if I go through that enough, then I'll just call a city and just start cold calling people. And when do you role play and practice? Uh, I do one at 1030 and then I do some in the afternoon at different times with, uh, with different agents. Okay. But, I, you know, I also spend a lot of time with myself, writing out different things, you know, and, and practicing also with myself. A, a lot of people don't realize, I mean, role playing with yourself and coming up with your own scripts is just as valuable. The thing is, is when I was coming up, I was role playing three times a day with the best agents in the country. I was listening to Dave Abdallah. There was Neil Weichel. You know, there was Ender, Ender Elke. I mean, Ender mm-hmm. Elke was like the smoothest person I ever heard. He had this voice and he had these objections and was calm. And I got to test my skills against those people every single day. And you start to see like, wow, like I see why they sell a lot. But then as you start getting good, you start realizing that if your skills are just as good as them, but you don't have the results they have, that means that your systems aren't that good. Because remember, skills is one thing, but you also have to create systems around that skills to be able to do the things that you need. It's like a lot of people, you know, they'll be like, oh, I don't need an assistant. How can you sell 50 houses and be a full-time assistant and be an agent? You can't do that. Like, I can't afford it. Well, you can't afford not to either. Like if you don't put pieces around you that allow you to do what you do best, then you just have to do all the rest, which doesn't pay. Just like for me, a driver, you pay someone $15, $20 an hour to drive me around. So for eight hours a day, it costs me, what, $160. When I prospect, I make $3,400 every hour I call. So for, think about that. For a $20 investment, I make over $3,000. That's a pretty good return. See, that's what people don't realize. That's what Amber does, yes. Here's the thing you don't realize is that when you're paying someone to drive you, you're not paying them to drive you, you're paying to make calls. It's like when I have a babysitter, I'm not paying them to watch my kids. I'm paying them so I can spend time with my wife. See, I'm buying my time back. That's what you have to realize. To be successful, you have to buy your time back. And most people don't value their time. It's like, I'll do an admin thing. Like, why would you spend something where that you can hire someone for 15 or 20 hours when you can call? And most people, if they're calling, are going to make three, four, five, six hundred bucks if you're good, a thousand. Why would you give up a thousand dollars? to do something in, that, that, that only costs 15 to 20. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Too many people do not value their time because as an agent, you could be busy all day and not make a dollar. True. 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 Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Absolutely great. Let's unmute yourselves. Unmute yourselves. Let's give Mike a big hand. Come on, everybody. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Good job. Good job. Wow. That was great. Thank you. I appreciate it. That was powerful. Amazing. Very good. Excellent. Mike, what we do now is we kind of go around the room and and I ask the group, what did they learn in the last, you know, few minutes? I understand you may have a hard stop, but if not, we'd love to uh, have you hang around and maybe comment on some of the comments. Sure. Can we okay. have your info though before anything it, else? It's in the box. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. It, it's in the chat box. Thank you. All right. All right. Great job, Mike. Fantastic. Okay. So what did we learn today? What did we learn from Mike Putnam today? Who wants to go first? Just raise your hand or jump in. Tess, go ahead. Okay. What I really liked about it is he is very obsessed in improving. Ya terminó, ya terminó. Totally obsessed with improving. Ah, está invitado todavía, pero. He, hold on, he, hold on. Wait, 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 wait one second. I'm going to. ¿Cómo te fue? I got it. Okay, and then unmute yourself, Tess. When he is talking to a client, he actually listens to the client. And when he cannot, this is how I understood it from him. When he is not really understanding that objection, this is my thinking, he writes that objection and studies it and learns it. Yes. That's the best part. I think that is so good. And I will apply that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. I love it. All right. Good job. Thanks. Second, Michael Patab. Um, couple of things was if uh, this is something Larry keeps telling me, my coach, and it's if you can't show them that you care, then why they care about what you have to say? Right. He, he shows them that he cares. Passion, right. 
Exactly. Yeah. He shows them that he cares and therefore they connect with him. Perfect. And also uh, really learning to turn every statement into a question. Yeah, absolutely. Great stuff. Good. Chris, you had your hand up. Mike and uh, Michael. Michael, sorry. I'm just saying, remember when my ferry said, if I come to your town and work against you, I'm going to beat you all the time. I don't think on Michael's town, he's super good. Yeah, I agree. I think it's possible to do the same thing. Denise, you had your hand up? Denise Garcia? You know, Neil, I'll, I'll go. Yeah. Mike Putnam, I love you. I just do. I just do. We have a, we have a little bit. Of a uh, it, it's it's you know it's just uh, you know it's just I just love this man. You know what I what I got out of this today, Neil. A couple things I wrote down is one what we've heard a thousand times over and over and over again is that anything that's wrong in your life can be solved with massive prospecting. That that that's that's number one and number two is he's a deal maker. We talk about being a deal maker. He yeah. is the, the statue of a deal maker. It's the, just the question of, well, I'm not interested in selling. Well, are you not interested in selling because you want to stay here longer or you don't think the market's that good? You know, it's he's trying to find emotion. He is looking for a deal all the time. It's just really, really phenomenal stuff. I, I love it. No, see. No, absolutely great. Mike, I, I have a question. Mike Putnam, one second. I, I, this is an assumption on my part for you. You probably hardly ever ask a client, if I could get you the most money in the world, would you sell? That's probably not one of your scripts, is it? No, mm -hmm. your script is more, you wanna get to their emotion to be able to push their button to get them to move, correct? Unmute, unmute. Yeah, because if you focus on money and money isn't what drives them, you lose the client. I need to find out what is the reason that they want to sell. What are they really getting at? Just like that guy, his whole reason for selling the house is that he wants to be closest to his daughter because he lost his family. And the house is the only thing stopping him from getting what he wants. When I can sell him on that, that dude doesn't give a shit about the money. He cares about his family. The moment I, I got that piece and I was able to connect his heart to his daughter. I mean, when he started crying, it was a beautiful moment. You know, I mean, he, I, when we left, he gave me a hug and he was just like, thank you. You know, I, I got the listing, but you know what? I mean, I helped him see that all that stuff he had in his head, it wasn't true. If I tried to sell him on money, he didn't give, I mean, don't get me wrong. He wanted money, but what he valued more than money was his daughter. And when I could get to that, I could sell him his daughter. You know, Mike, I think you, I want to use the clip in just the last 30 seconds. And I'm going to use it for all the agents that when I hear them say, you know, if I can get you money, if I can get you money, if I can get you money or 25 years I've been asking people not to do that. But I think I finally found the trigger in your last few minutes that is gonna help us. So thank you for that. That was great. Okay, uh, who else? We had, uh, uh, Denise, you had your hand up? Yeah, so I had my hand up before and I had a, a question, but I, I know that your mind is so powerful because the NLP, not a lot of people know about the NLP, which is a program that allows you to know yourself before others. And that's a really powerful uh, tool for people to look into. But my question would be for you, as in what what program or what session did was so powerful for you that changed your mindset completely different? I mean, what changed my mindset was growing up broke and, and not having what I wanted and seeing my parents fight about money. And, you know, when I was growing up, my dad never told me he was proud of me. And, you know, my whole life, I felt like I had to prove that I was something to him. You know, I, I mean, most of my obsession in my life until I was 30, because he didn't tell me he was proud of me until, you know, I was probably 32 years old was I was obsessed with, with, with him telling me he was proud of me to know that I was something, you know what I mean? And I had something to prove to him. So when you have a chip on your shoulder and you feel less than, you know, it either drives you or destroys you. Mm -hmm. So instead of it destroying me, it, it drove me. I became obsessed with every NFFB program. I mean, one of the best things they have for beginners is, is called Master the Influence with Anthony Robbins. He goes through just basic reframes and it just gives you kind of a general idea of what it like to start to learn language patterns where you can 
change the way people think. You know, it's not about this. The real question is that, you know, and, and you just start to learn how to get rapport with people. You learn how to build trust with people. You learn how to communicate because, you know, we want to be good salespeople. But if you really, really, really want to be successful, you want to be a master communicator. You want to be able to feel your clients because when you can feel them, you can ask questions in a way that they can receive it. You know, just like, you know, if I wasn't skilled and I started talking about this guy, I can you feel pain and I wasn't ready to get what he was going to say back. You know, that can get really bad. But when you know people, and you care enough to want to know. See, that's the thing. Are you asking because you want a listing? Are you asking because you really care about that human? Because regardless if he hires you, you care that he's not going to suffer. Because for me, I care about people. So when I see someone suffering, regardless of my relationship, I want to help them. I'm drawn to people that, that, that are like that, you know, because I know I can help. But the question is, are you doing it because you really want to know or because you want a listing? Most people want a listing and that's why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Next question. Thank you, Mike. Next question out there. I, I, well, it, was, it wasn't a question, but I just wanted to... Um, I wanted to, to just unbelievable, such great stuff. And, and I'm privileged. I'm here with Barry. And when you talked about the, the interest rate and the money of spending the extra hundred thousand dollars, I mean, both of us like, like yelled out loud, like we had just watched Kobe make that winning shot. <laughs> it just so connected in, in you're just such a competitor and, and and it, I don't know if it's the NLP, the, the stuff, but when you were talking about being on that boat with your family, uh, it was like you were manifesting more of that before our eyes. And I think I commented, like, he's manifesting that right now. You can see in your ability to, to be a storyteller and, and put them in that position. It's just unbelievable. Really, really good stuff. So no, thank you for your time. You have to realize something on the days you don't feel like working. You have to remind yourself who benefits by me going and doing it. Sure. My clients do, but like, look what I get to provide my wife, my family, my kids, my neighbors, you know, I mean, I'm a role model for a lot of people. It's just, you know, by me doing my job at the highest level, like so many people benefit. And on the days that I don't feel like it, you have to realize we'll do more for other people than we ever will for ourselves. So if you won't do it for ourselves, shut your eyes and think, who else benefits? You know, there's some days where I'm just tired. and I don't want to get up and I'll just go look at my daughter sleeping. You know, some days I'll just have tears down my eyes because like me working so hard provides this beautiful life for them. And they're like, shit, if I'm not going to do it for myself, I will for them. And when you come from that place, I'm getting motion just thinking about it. It just, it drives you. It drives you to what more because so many people benefited. Like how beautiful would that be at the end of your life to know that you benefited so many people, you, so many people you impacted just because you were obsessed with being the best version of yourself. And it's a, it's a beautiful feeling. That's right. I love it. Do it. Good <laughs> stuff. Thank you. Christina, you Very have high. a check mark. I have a check mark. Yeah, I'm your. Oh, you want to? I, I, well, didn't... I actually have a comment for Michael. Sure. I wanted to say that it's it's amazing the self confidence you got you do have. Thank and you. I wanted to ask you how was becoming that person that we hear today. I mean, it's a it's right. a it's a journey. You know, as I said, people look at overnight sensation. It's you know, 20 plus years in the making of grinding and working and failing and falling down. I mean, I know that on the last call, if he still has it, you know, I talked about the failures along the way because everyone uh -huh. looks at success as being this beautiful thing. You know, if you listen to the last call, I mean, there was a lot of challenges that I had to go through where, you know, if I had done a couple of things differently, I may not even be here as a real estate agent, you know, because remember when like tough times happen, they either drive you or destroy you. Most people get destroyed in that moment. But, you know, if you can push past it and use that pain to drive you, it's so beautiful what's on the other side. And most people don't realize what's on the other side isn't that far away. It's just a little more focus, a little more practice, and a lot more discipline. And what do you recommend, like, um, to become more self-confident and be able to, to tag the way you tag? <laughs> Say that one more time. How what do you is what you will self-confident and talk the way you talk? Is that kind of what you said, Christina? Yeah. I think the way you get self-confidence is you do something every single day over and over and over and you do it so well. It's like right now, if I asked you, could you tell me the alphabet A to Z? How confident are you that you could do it? Very confident. <laughs> Why? Why? Well, because I mean, I'm it's been, an it's old... been in your head year after year after year. Yes. Yes. 
when you study how to talk to people and you become obsessed with scripts and you become obsessed with communication, it's like walking into every presentation knowing every single answer in advance. When you know what people are going to say and do, because you have to realize if you ask the right questions in the right sequence the same way, you get to predict what people are going to say before they say it. When I'm asking questions with people, I'm asking questions because I'm leading them to what I want them to say. So it's very uh-huh. easy. I already know the answers because I'm the one asking the question. Remember, God gave you two ears and one mouth. So we need to listen twice as much as we talk. See, when you're talking and asking questions, you're in control, but you can't do that if you're not listening. See, when you listen to what people say, you can be in control because you control people through questions. That's where self-confidence, self-confidence comes in by doing it every single day over and over and over, regardless if you want to. And if you do that every day, as I said, it, it stacks up. And then there's a part where just people can't catch up to you because you, you've, you've put the time in. The question is, is that if you want self-confidence, what are you willing to do to have it? What are you willing to commit to? How many hours are you willing to practice the words that you don't know? How much are you willing to practice talking to people? You know, it, it's a commitment. Because remember, you don't want to know how to talk to people. You want to become the kind of person that does that. You don't want to do things in your life. You want to become those things. Because then you don't have to do it. That's the beautiful part. When you become those things, that's just who you are. You're loving, you're mm-hmm. caring, you're charming, you're funny, you know, like you want to become that kind of person, but it, you only become that person by consciously choosing to be that person. That's so All great. Right, really Thank you. Stuff, Thank you for it. Thank you, yes. Michael. Fantastic. All right, let's unmute yourselves. Let's give them a big hand. Woo! All right. Woo! Yay. Yay. Awesome. Good job. Thank you, Mike. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Thank loved you. it. Check your time. All right, everybody. Um, okay. Fantastic, Mike. Really appreciate it. We're going to go back to open mic right now at three at 1:30. Uh, Lewis, looks like you're up. Matab, you're right after him. Denise, Dave, and Robert's got a world-class class at 3:30. He's going to talk about let's minutes. just call it a class. Let's just call it a class. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I got to head out. Thank you all again so much. Mike, thanks again, buddy. Thank, thank you. Thank, right. you, thank, thank you, you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Woo! Amazing. Powerful. Thank you, Neil. Amazing. No, thank you. Everybody is really. Thank you, Neil. We all work off of each other's power. Thank you, Neil. Thank I you. think the class is about this. Hi, Robert. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Robert's just going to play the tape. I'm again. just going to play this again. <laughs> <laughs> and then take Robert has a it. man crush. <laughs> I, I, well, uh, look at the first time we interviewed him. Maybe it's because I'm an, an expressive, but I, I, Mike Putnam, for me, the first time, I, I just was just so great and so powerful. So when we said we're going to do it a second time, I was thrilled. And somehow he topped the first one. So I, I love that you, before I, I, I thought he's an expressive, but he comes like he's a strong expressive. I'm like, yes, I can be that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, well, what I well here's too? how you know he's an expressive. Neil said, Mike, tell me about yourself. And then Neil fell offline. <laughs> <laughs> And Neil got back online and Mike was just ending. I noticed. So it's an expressive. Sure. Can I, can I share one quick thing? Yes. Yeah. I noticed that. Uh, can we get more uh, people who are coached by Steve Powers? I mean, uh, most of the people who are coached by Steve Powers are like, wow. <laughs> How do you notice that? I'll do, we'll do the best we can. I know. I'm just saying. <laughs> there are we'll great the coaches out there, honestly. So good job, good job. All right, good job, everybody. Let's. We got a whole afternoon. Let's go get it. <laughs>